guys, it's your boy Luke, here for our DFS Core Picks at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Here in this video, we'll be covering my top six DFS plays on the slate, one in each price range that I'll be building a lot of my GBP lineups around. Last week at the Honda Classic was definitely a little bit of a doozy. It was an extremely volatile week. We had a lot of the chalk end up missing the cut, relatively low six of six rates, which isn't a surprise for the Honda Classic. It's typically carnage with the conditions that we get there year in and year out. And if you end up getting the short stick um, when it comes to the weather or the draw, it really doesn't matter how good of a player you are. I mean, just ask Shane Lowry or Daniel Berger on that last hole who had to play through an absolute monsoon. If it weren't for that, I really do expect that one of them would at the very least have forced a playoff and the story could have been completely different. So don't beat yourself up too much if you had a bad week. A lot of the lower owned leverage plays that we targeted ended up being our best plays on the slate. It's just one of those weeks when it comes to DFS, you got to expect there to be that carnage in that chaos. Fortunately for us, though, this week at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, the API, it's a much more predictable event. First off, course history is extremely important here. You see a lot of correlation to past success and how players play here into the future. It's also a course where we have a ton of data for. It's a golf course that has been on the rotation for over 40 years here on the PGA Tour, which means there aren't really any surprises when it comes to the API. The only real X factor, of course, is the weather, which we'll have to keep an eye on come the end of the week. But when we're in, when we're in Florida, you want to expect the unexpected. So that's how we're heading into the week. With that being said, let's go ahead and hop right on into our picks here for this week's API. All right, first off, a review of the golf course before we hop into the plays. If you haven't already seen my full course breakdown, I highly recommend you guys go ahead and check that out. A link will be in the description of this video to go ahead and do so. But if you just want the Spark Notes version, here it is. This is a ball striker's paradise, just like what we saw at the Honda Classic. If you get a little bit offline, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, whether it's on the holes without water in play, where you have some of the gnarliest rough in all of the PGA Tour here at Bay Hill. You also have plenty of water, water hazards in play, whether it's off the tee or into greens, and some of the most penal sand bunkers that we have on all of the PGA Tour. So it's not a surprise that she shots gained off the tee and shots gained approach as my first two stats in my modeling, both at 35% weighting a piece. In terms of the approach breakdown, a lot of my focus is on the 200 plus yard range. Of course, the 175 to 200 yard range as well. The other ranges kind of sprinkled in there because if there's one thing you have to do at Bay Hill, it's hit your long irons. The average par three length is 212 yards. A lot of the par fours, you're looking at hitting 175 yard plus iron shots on almost every single hole. So as a result, Definitely taking an extra look at those two categories. Putting, of course, is important in Florida, particularly on these Bermuda grass surfaces that have a lot of green. It also tends to get very windy here at Bay Hill. So I'm taking a look at windy conditions, also shots gained at Bay Hill in general, because we've seen so much correlation to success based on past performances here. Also sand saves because of these bunkers that are extremely difficult and fairways gained as well to help mitigate some of that rough. With that being said, our spend up option for this week is somebody that's had a ton of success at Bay Hill over the years. That being Rory McIlroy at $11,100. The modeling absolutely loves the guy and how could you blame it? If you take a look at the course history, Rory McIlroy has been by far the best player in the world here. He has four top six finishes, of course a win during that stretch, multiple top fives, and his worst finish was last year at a 10th place. He was my pick to win last year, somebody that I thought was going to come through for his second victory, and I really can't get off the train. I mean, a 10th place finish felt disappointing for us last year, and now with Bryson DeChambeau out of the field, who is an enigma on his own, somebody who this golf course is just made perfectly for, now that man is Rory McIlroy. If we take a look at the recent form, he hasn't played a ton on the PGA Tour. You can see the last time we saw him was at the Genesis Invitational where he ended up finishing at 10th, not too bad, but he had been playing over there in the Middle East. He had multiple made cuts, a couple top fives, the win at the Zozo Championship earlier this year. Roy McIlroy is coming in with some great form, and the shots gain metrics do back that up. In every category but approach, he's a significant gainer, but perhaps the most telling of all of them is the putter, where he's gaining nearly half a stroke per round. That's something that really escaped Rory there in the early parts of 2021. It's why we didn't really see him have his best stuff. When he broke through at the Wells Fargo Championship, the first thing to turn around was the putter. And then in the fall, particularly towards the beginning here of 2022, it has been the approach play that's really carried him back to his 
form of the early 2000s, early 2022s, that everything like that. Uh, I'm expecting huge things from Rory McIlroy this year. The approach play is really the last missing piece for him. He spiked in that department from time to time when he won at the Zozo, but it's absolutely fantastic with the approach play. Unfortunately, we didn't have the shots gain metrics for that. I just think everything's looking up for him. If we take a look at the last 50 measured rounds, take an even larger snapshot of his game. The off the tee play gets even better, so we could see a little bit of positive regression there. Still gaining significantly with the putter, and around the green and approach play are both positives. So if he's going to be gaining across all four statistical categories, he has by far the best course history of anyone in this field. The recent form a little bit underrated because he's been playing over there in the Middle East. There's no reason not to play Rory this week. The only thing that could hold me back would be ownership. He's for sure going to be one of the chalkiest plays on the slate. But as of right now, I can't find a reason to fade him. If John Rahm ends up coming in at 10 to 15% ownership, and let's say Rory's 35 to 40%, then we might be talking about playing John Rahm as our core play up top come Wednesday evening. But until we get those type of numbers, I'm going to be rolling with Rory McIlroy. Next up, our second man in is going to be Mark Leishman, and I was really in a toss-up between using Matt Fitzpatrick or going to Mark Leishman, but I'm expecting Fitzpatrick to be much higher owned than a Leishman just because a lot of the public sentiment on Fitzpatrick seems to be extremely positive, and I really cannot blame them, right? The course fit is immaculate, number three in the field. The recent form, more than okay as well, but if we take a look at Mark Leishman, he's almost on just a good a stretch of golf, if not better, especially when it comes to the course history. So we take a look at the course history. Both of them have had excellent track records. Of course, Matt Fitzpatrick, he's had four of five made cuts. He had a second place finish here, a couple other top tens, a 13th place finish as well. But Mark Leishman has a win, a second, also four or five made cuts. The only real difference here is that Mark Leishman ended up missing the cut last year. And I think that something that people forget about Leishman is that in the early parts of 2021, there really wasn't a worse player on tour. He was playing some of the worst golf that we've ever seen from Leishman. He was losing strokes in every single shots gained category. So to hold that against him when he really looks like a completely different player of late just isn't fair. I mean, take a look at this recent form, and he hasn't played all that much of late, really two events out of the last five on tour, but he has a 15th at the Genesis, a golf course that really doesn't fit his game all that well, but he still had some decent performances there because he's a high quality player. And then at the Farmers, it's a tournament that he's won before, so that's that's not necessarily so much surprising, but he posted a 16th place finish. So it could be being a little bit overlooked. I mean, when we're doing a one-to-one -one analysis between him and Fitzpatrick, I prefer Leishman, right? The approach play has been much better for Mark Leishman. The off the tee play, better for Leishman as well. And I don't think many people would have expected that. I mean, Leishman can definitely get hairy from time to time off the tee. But if we take a look at just the last 24 measured rounds, he's actually been a better player than Fitzpatrick. The putter has been really close between the two. You can see a slight favoring towards Leishman. So in general, I do like Leishman a little bit more this week. And if you take a look at a larger sample size, that's when you start to see Matt Fitzpatrick kind of pull away. Of course, the off-the-tee numbers start to resemble their true numbers a little bit, right? Mark Leishman, not the best off-the-tee player. But the recent form looks great. I expect the ownership to be lower on somebody like a Mark Leishman. Elite course history, great putter on Bermuda grass as well going to be somebody that I'm playing a ton of this week. Next up for our bread and butter play, we're going to have Keith Mitchell, who we got to ride this Keith Mitchell train. I mean, he's been an unbelievable form over the last two months, really since the start of this season. There hasn't been many better players in the world. In this field, only John Rahm has had a better stretch of form than him. At $8,100, I think the price tag is more than fair. It might be a little bit of sticker shock, especially when we consider the guys around him. I mean, like a Tommy Fleetwood, Jason Kokrak, even a Russell Henley. He's a little bit overpriced, but the recent form really tells us everything we need to know. But let's go ahead and start off with course history, which has been also something to write a home about with a Keith Mitchell. You can see he's played here three times. He had a sixth in his first ever finish, a fifth, and then a 43rd place finish. That is just excellent stuff right there. The recent form has also been a highlight. You had the made cut there at the Honda Classic, where he really charged up the leaderboard there on Sunday, the whole way up into the top 10. He also had a top 10 at the Waste Management, a 12th place finish at Pebble Beach, and the recent four metrics are just out of this world. I mean, take a look at these ball striking numbers. First off, gaining seven tenths of a stroke per round off the tee. The approach numbers have been a positive. That's typically something that Keith Mitchell can be volatile with. The putter's been there, gaining over a third of a stroke per round. And even the around the green play, which is by far his weakest point of his game, 
he's still been a positive. So even at this difficult track, a course where he's had success in the past, I'm expecting him to ride that momentum. Of course, here in the fall, he was going out there making cuts at golf courses that really didn't suit his game. On the other hand, here at Bay Hill, this is a perfect fit for Keith Mitchell because if there's anything that he does extremely well, it's hit those long irons. I mean, just think when he was in contention with Roy McIlroy at the Wells Fargo Championship, Quail Hollow, a golf course where you have to hit those long irons. Lots of long par threes, lots of uphill shots that are 180, 190 yards. And who won that golf tournament? Rory McIlroy. So is it a surprise at all that Rory McIlroy and Keith Mitchell make the list here as core picks on the same week? Not at all. Very similar skill sets. You usually see them succeed at these similar type of events. And really a comp that I wasn't considering early in the week that I'm starting to highly use now is Quail Hollow, right? With a lot of those longer iron shots, we have seen a lot of crossover between that event and, of course, what we're going to see this week at Bay Hill. I mean, even Mark Leishman has had success at both golf courses. So if he's going to come in with moderate ownership, particularly with some of the guys priced around him, probably my favorite play on the entire slate. Next up for our value pick, we're going to have Corey Connors at $7,600. In terms of his course history, he hasn't played here a ton, but the last time he was here, he finished in third place. His other two starts were missed cuts, which aren't all that great. But one thing that we know about winners at this event specifically is seven of the last eight have had a top five before winning. So if we're going to try and take somebody down low that has a legit chance of winning this golf tournament, he at least fits that box. The recent form has also been a bright spot for Corey Connors. It might not look at it from the surface, right? Miscut, miscut, 38th plenish. But if you take a look at the shots gained, again, this is usually a better measure of how a player is playing because he's missed a lot of cuts here just on the mark. He's still gaining over half a stroke per round off the tee, still gaining on approach. The around the green play, we can give him a little bit of a pass for. He's never the best around the green player on tour, but he's been a gainer with the putter. So if he can go out there, gain his usual two to three strokes on approach for the event, continue the off the tee play, if he continues to be a positive putter, this guy's going to put up some crazy performances. I mean, it was last year at this exact time of the year when he got down to Florida where he started to put up a huge string of golf. I mean, that first Third, first finish where he finished third place at this event last year was the start of a huge run of made cuts. In fact, he made 19 of his 20 next made cuts. He went on a stretch of gaining strokes on Bermuda grass. We're back to Bermuda, back in Florida. Perhaps he can spike that type of a putting performance again and perhaps put up a win this time around. So I really do like Corey Connors. I think that the course history is a little bit underrated, particularly with the third place finish last year. The recent form as well, he's number 13 in the field. And that's with two of his last three starts being a missed cut. It just looks a lot worse than it's actually been in reality. And I also think he's a little bit underpriced for this field as well. Now for our diamond in the rough, that is going to be Keegan Bradley at $7,300. And Keegan Bradley, much like a Corey Connors, went on a run of golf at this time of the year last year. He's somebody who on Bermuda grass went on a streak of about two months where he was a gainer. And this is really where he went out there. He almost won the Valspar, also posted a few other top 10 finishes during that stretch and went on a made cut streak where he made nine of 10 cuts. The course history has been elite for somebody like a Keegan Bradley. So if we take a look at it, a 10th place last year, 42nd in 2020, and he's made his last five cuts. Obviously, other than the 10th place finish last year, nothing has been all that crazy, but it's good to know that he's been very consistent at this event for the very least. The recent form is also something that I like for a Keegan Bradley. It's not like it's jumping off the board, but that's three straight made cuts at the Genesis, the Waste Management, and of course the Farmers. And if we take a look at the shots gain metrics, kind of do a little bit of a deep dive into how he's been playing, it's sustainable. Gaining off the tee, gaining over half a stroke per round on approach. That's what Keegan Bradley does. He's extremely precise in both categories. Gaining around the green. He's also very solid at getting up and down. And right on brand, losing a ton of strokes with the putter. The beauty is a lot of those rounds were on Poa Anua, which is by far the worst surface for a Keegan Bradley. Now we get him back down in Florida, the surface where he found that magical flat stick last year. And if he can go out and do it at just $7,300, he has a legit chance of winning this golf tournament. I mean, the guy's been extremely consistent here to begin with. He's somebody who I not only think has extremely high upside this week, but of course, with all these made cuts in a row here at this venue, also brings a lot of safety to the table. And now finally, our flyer pick. 
way far down the board here is going to be Pan Kazire at 6,500 bucks. The modeling absolutely loves the guy this week, somebody who's long off the tee. The approach play of late has been a bright spot for Kazire. And of course, on Bermuda grass, tends to make a ton of putts. So the recent form for Kazire isn't really jumping off the boards. It's really more the metrics that are making him jump out the board. I mean, just a couple made cuts out of his last three, a 10th place finish at the waste management, really carrying a lot of the shots gain metrics. The course history, I believe it's non-existent. The last time I checked, yeah, he hadn't played here before, right? It's because he, I'm sorry, he had played here before. I'm mistaken that. 50, 57th place finish, but he only played three times in the last five years. And the last time he played here was last year, and it was a 57. So not really anything we can glean from it. But again, it's more the recent form that's sticking out for somebody like a Kazire. Because look at these shots gain metrics. Just completely popping in the category. He's getting six tenths of a stroke per round on approach. He's gaining off the tee. The around green plays, never really a bright spot for Kazire. Neither is the putter. He tends to be a little bit streaky in that category. But like I mentioned before, if there's one grass surface where Kazire goes out there and really makes his hay, it's on Bermuda grass, where he gains nearly six tenths of a stroke per round. If he continues the off the tee play where he's been one of the better players in this 6K range, of course, one of the best players on approach period in the entire field and gets back to his usual self with the putter on this surface, he's going to have a huge week. I mean, he's typically somebody that we're looking at in showdown because he has that volatility from round to round. He's easily able to post seven to eight under rounds. We saw that multiple times on Sunday last year. The guy had a knack for doing that on the last round, vaulting himself up the leaderboard. I like his upside. I like the course fit. I also like the fact that he's probably going to be extremely low owned. I don't think a lot of people are going to be running to the window to play somebody like a Pan Kazire, making him one of my favorite plays in all of the sleep. That's all I've got for my core picks here at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Before you guys go on and get out of here, make sure you go ahead and let me know down in the comments who you guys have winning this golf tournament. For me, I do think that Rory McIlroy has a real shot at winning it, but I wouldn't be surprised if Mark Leishman came through for his second ever win. I think he has legit upside there. A few other guys I'd be keeping my eyes on, Corey Connors, Keegan Bradley, as I mentioned, if they can go out there and gain a few strokes on the greens this week, much like what a Luke List ended up doing there at Torrey Pines, they could very easily win this thing. It just perfect course fits. We've seen them spike on this perform a surface in the past, much like how a Luke List had spiked on POA in the past from time to time. Um, the more and more I think about it, the more and more I know I'm going to be placing outright bets on those two. But whoever you guys end up picking, make sure to go ahead and let me know down below. As always, going to have even more content coming throughout the week, whether it's our value picks, which will be coming out later on tonight. We'll have our fades and sleepers, our weekly DFS live stream showdown content. We'll also have prize picks content dropping throughout the weekend. So make sure to keep an eye out for all of that. But until next time, guys, good luck with all of your lineups for this week. And let's get this cash.